you'd be turning your Bibles, please, to Ezekiel, the 17th chapter. We begin Lesson 5 this morning in our Bible class. We're going to be introduced to a riddle, a proverb. It's an allegory, and it's a type of, of teaching that Jesus did in parables. But by the idea of being a riddle, and it's in the form of an allegory, there's a sense of, well, puzzlement. Do you really know what's going to happen? And he gives you a story. And what we're introduced to here in this particular 17th chapter is about two eagles. Two eagles represent one person. Different aspects of, of the kings of Judah and the Nebuchadnezzar, Bab the Babylonians, Babylonians who take them captive. But Ezekiel, remember, we're looking here around you know, close to getting close to 591 B.C., which we'll, we've dated that as far as the uh, lesson is concerned. But we're coming to that uh, section where it, it will be definitely told you in, in a couple of uh, chapters. So of uh, where we are, but with 591 B.C. and where Ezekiel is in Babylonian captivity, and he's been able in the spirit to go to Jerusalem and, and see the, the corruption that's there. But the problem is, will there be 70 years there? <laughs> or as uh, Head and I was, was the prophet said, we'll be here in two years. Well, he's dead in seven months. So that, he was a false prophet, wasn't he? And he was uh, what he was telling them. And they needed to be involved in building their houses. It's going to be, it's going to be a while. Here, we're going to be introduced to something that we'll see in the Chronicles and Kings, where Zedekiah made an oath before God to Nebuchadnezzar that he'd be submitting to him. In the middle part of this 17th chapter, we'll observe that. He rebelled, and God was against him, Nebuchadnezzar was against him. We summed up what Nebuchadnezzar was against him, but you do not break oaths with God, and we're going to see that in this section. But let's look at how it opens in verse 1. The word of Jehovah came unto me, saying, Son of man, that's his, his, that's his characterization of, of Ezekiel. Son of man, put forth, my Bible says, a riddle. It's going to be kind of something that, so, well, what do you think about this? It's a puzzle, but maybe. And speak a parable unto the house of Israel, and say, Thus saith the Lord, Jehovah and therefore we get into the allegorical form we got uh, eagles with wings and they got the first one has uh, various colors they have uh, large wings and and they are going to Lebanon led to Lebanon and they're going to take the top of the twigs of the cedars and we're going to see what does that mean you'll notice in verse 9 thus saith the Lord Jehovah shall prosper there's your riddle aspect We've already seen the allegorical aspect of the parable. Is he going to prosper? Shall he not pull up the roots thereof? And so we need to figure out in these, these first few verses exactly who is he talking about. And I'm just saying, think about Babylon, think about the kings of Judah, and think about the people of Judah. Because what we're going to see beginning uh, with verse 7, we're going to see another aspect of these, of these, of these people. And uh, then we're going to see how God deals with that, these twigs and, and plants the vine and so forth like that as we go through this. So let's, let's look at, notice in verse 6, it grew and became a spreading view of low stature. So these first five verses is the eagle plucking the top of the cedars. Verse 5 so verses 1 through 4 is the key. Now verse 5, we're going to say, what is that vine? I'm saying to you, that's the people left behind. That's the people in Judah that will be there when Zedekiah revolts in his oath, and he's going to be the one that, that uh, they go into captivity. Notice that it was low stature, especially compared to the great cedars of Lebanon. But low stature, whose branches turned toward him. The eagle and the roots thereof were under him, so it became a vine and brought forth branches and shot forth springs. Uh, uh, yep, springs. And there was also another eagle with great wings, and he comes down, and then are those people going to submit to them? And then we're going to see that, that section. So 
this is, I think, will, will, it fits with what we know in history as well. So let's, let's begin. Who do the two great eagles represent? So let's see, here's the first eagle. He says, a great eagle with great wings and long pinions full of feathers, which had divers colors, came into Lebanon and took the top of the cedar. He cropped off of the utmost of the young twigs thereof and carried into a land of traffic and, let it, and, and, and set it in a city of merchants. What we see in the latter part of chapter 16, that place of traffic was Babylon. So we have no doubt we're talking about taking something to Babylon. He takes the top twig of the cedars and also the others, the young twigs thereof. He's going to take the great, the, the most important of the of the people of uh, Judah. And that's exactly what we know uh, took place. And we have those events of uh, Jehoaz and, and Jehoiakim and Jehoiakim and Zedekiah. And we're realizing that two of them, as we'll see in the Lamentations in a, in a little bit, that the two of them went into exile, there's a Lamentations for them. One was deposed, he didn't go into exile, and Zedekiah went, uh, and, and he, he went off as well. So there'll be Lamentations for them, but right now we're trying to realize who, who are these, who are these, these people that we're, we're talking about? How, how, do they, how do they relate? So chapter 16 and verse 29, notice where we can be confident that we know where they're going. Thou hast moreover multiplied thy whoredom unto the land of traffic unto Chaldea. What's the land of traffic in this context? It's where merchants would do their business. They'd be driving, going through these places that are a place of, of traffic. Canaan was described as that unto Chaldea, and yet that was not satisfied there, there with. So there's the idolatry that's taking place among them. But that's who he's going to take it to. So who would be the utmost high? King. And taking him into, into captivity. And we know that Jehoiachin, and they went into, went into captivity. Jehoiachin will be able to, to, to survive there. But we see that there, verse 5, there's that low stature. So these two eagles, I think, are the same people. Because he says, another great eagle, verse 7, with great wings and many feathers. Behold, the, this vine did bend its roots toward him. That's one of our questions. And shot, and, shot forth, and, and shot forth the branches toward him from the beds of his plantation that he might water it, relying upon him. But they're going to turn in the days of Zedekiah and break the oath. And we'll come back to that in a moment. So the two eagles... They're, they're kind of described differently, whether one's of colors and others didn't have that. But they're eagles. They have many feathers uh, and they're able to go to that top. That's just the story. That's the allegory that represents somebody. It's not like them. It's not a simile. It's an allegory. That's, re that's who that represents. And so I think it's right to realize that we're talking about the kings. He takes the, the young twigs with them. They go into Chaldea and he took also the seed of the land. Now in verse five, we now change that indeed he's taking them. And there's another, another great eagle that stands there. Uh, he's, he's Nebuchadnezzar. Now he's going to realize you're going to have to submit to me if you're going to prosper. And they're, they're not going to do that. So I think the two eagles are not two different people are two different identities. That's Chaldea, relationship with the kings and relationship with those who went off into the, the first part of that captivity and the people that were left in the land and how what's going to happen to them. Who does the top of the cedar represent? Jehoiachin, going to get, get that, the king of, of Judah. Uh, and he went about 597 B.C. is when we're talking about that. First time 606 B.C. Daniel went. Ezekiel went with this, uh, this group. So that's the top of the cedar. What did the first great eagle desire? What in verses 1 through 4, what did this great eagle desire? The king of Judah. Going to take the headship of, 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 the, of the people of Israel. And in verse 5, he's also, they're desiring the seed of the land. There's your people. 
that they're going to have to submit to him. Why was the second uh, eagle uh, approached? Verse 7, there was also another eagle, great eagle, with great wings and many feathers. And behold, the vine did bend its roots toward him and shot forth its branches toward him from the beds of his plantation that he might water it. Who waters it? Well, Nebuchadnezzar. We're bending toward the, where our sustenance lies. And we, I think we have flowers in our gardens and we have plants that uh, they, will, they will gravitate, le sometimes even leaning toward the what? The sun. And especially if they're getting blinded by other trees, they'll, they'll find a way to try to get that, that sun. And uh, here is bending toward that to receive the, the water. They're going, they're going to sustain them. So when we look at these first three, few questions, I think we can run through that. The two great eagles represent Chaldea. Nebuchadnezzar is going to put uh, a name to that. Who does the top of the cedar represent? King. Jehoiachin, if you want to be particular. What did the first eagle uh, desire? Take the king. He desired the king. Plucked it off the top with the young twigs that were with that. The second eagle was approached because they could indeed, they were told by God through the prophets, Jeremiah, that indeed they should submit to the Chaldeans because God was bringing judgment upon them, but they would, would not uh, do that. So let's, let's look at this section here about the, the things that what, what happened here. Notice, see, know ye not, and he explains, see if this is not true. Verse 12. These things, what do these things mean? Are they going to prosper, as he said in the earlier verses, the going to prosper they're not they're going to fall away know you not that these saints tell them behold the king of Babylon came to Jerusalem and took the king thereof and the princes thereof so that's, we were right about that and brought them to him to Babylon brought, brought them to him to Babylon and he took of the seed royal and made a covenant with them he also brought under brought him under an oath to to, to and took away and took away the mighty hand, mighty of the land, that the kingdom might be base. So here was something that was going to benefit Nebuchadnezzar, that it might not lift itself up, but that it might be keeping the covenant, keeping a covenant made with an oath. But he rebelled against him and sending his ambassadors into Egypt, that they might give him horses and much people. Shall he prosper? He said, Question again. So now what's it all? Are these people going to prosper in the land, the plantation, bending toward Nebuchadnezzar? God wanted them to do that for these 70 years, but they, they, they made a covenant to do so. So let, let's notice what we're looking at in this, in this uh, the covenants that we're, we're looking at. Look at 2 Chronicles 36, 13. And that we can look in details, but this, this is what... Uh, Gets us in a historical point of this of these, this parable that we're looking at. But Second Chronicles uh, thirty six and verse thirteen is what I wrote here. Notice who's king Zedekiah, verse eleven. He also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who made him swear by God. You made an oath before me, the Nebuchadnezzar is to say before your God, but he stiffened his neck. He hardened his heart against turning unto Jehovah, the God of Israel. So he was involved in breaking that covenant. And we see what he turns to. Verse 15, he rebelled against him in sending his ambassadors into Egypt. So I'm going to get my strength, not from God. I'm not going to honor my oath toward God that I swore to King Nebuchadnezzar that will submit to you. He's now turning against them. Shall he prosper? That's why I said he's going to prosper. It, it's in the land. No, it's not going to happen. Uh, shall he break the covenant and yet escape? What's your answer? Class, what's your answer? No, you don't do that. Now notice how he, keeps, how he keeps hammering this. As I live, saith the Lord Jehovah, surely in the place where the king dwelleth that made him king, whose oath he despised, and whose covenant he break, even with him in the midst of Babylon, he shall die. Zedekiah did. He was 
capture and die. Neither shall Pharaoh with his mighty army and great company help him in the war when they cast up mounds and build forts to cut off many persons. There's the besiegement of the Babylonians in the days of Zedekiah. For he hath, for he hath despised the oath by breaking the covenant. Despised the oath. How? Broke the covenant. Didn't keep his word and promise. He's not going to, to escape. Surely as I live, my, my oath that he had despised and my covenant that he had broken, I will even bring it upon his own head. And I will spread my net upon him and he shall be taken he, he shall be in his snare and I will bring him to Babylon and will enter into judgment with him for, the, for, the, for his trespasses that he hath trespassed against me. And notice what happens with the rest of the people. Did they prosper? Those who were connected with him and all his fugitives. What would he call them fugitives? Because when Zedekiah left, the breach, he, he, the people were fleeing, he, especially his army did. <laughs> and all of his fugitives and all of his hands shall fall by the sword, and they, sh they remain shall be scattered toward every wind. And here's this phrase, and again, it's in the context of judgment. And you shall know that I, Jehovah, has spoken it. Why? Because it came true. It was something that was indeed uh, came, came true. So this is what Nebuchadnezzar did. So where, question number five, where was God to plant a tender twig as we, as we go from here? See, now God enters into this parable that we're looking at. And it's kind of the longest one in the Old Testament, by the way. And it is indeed setting forth now. He's going to bring what he's going to do in the future. It's interesting that when God brings judgment, it's, it's, it's harsh. It is an evil because it hurts so badly the people. It was discipline. It was discipline. But with that, he gave them hope, didn't he? Let's read this together. Thus saith the Lord Jehovah, I will also take of the lofty top of the cedar. Yeah, he's not an eagle. He's, I'll take the top. And I will set it. And I will crop off from the utmost of the young twigs, a tender one. And I will plant it upon a high and lofty mountain. In the mountain of the height of Israel will I plant it. Not Chaldeas, not Chaldea, not over there, but in Israel. And it shall bring forth bowls and boughs and bear fruit and be a goodly cedar. And under it shall dwell all the birds of every wing, and the shade of the branches thereof shall they dwell. And all the trees of the field shall know that I, Jehovah, have brought down the high tree, have exalted the low tree, have dried up the green tree, and have made the dry tree to flourish. I, Jehovah, have spoken it, have spoken and have done it. That's what he's going to do. And he did that. Do you see any messianic leanings here of interpretation? Kingdom, seed of mustard seed, it comes off and it becomes protection to things. The kingdom would come. And who is that exalted one that would come? It'd be Jesus Christ. And God is foreseeing this through Ezekiel. This is what I'm going to do in the future. That is going to, they're going to be my people. Those are the ones that are going to, uh, to proper, prosper. So God was to plant that tender twig where? In Israel, on the mountain. Isaiah would, as prophesied in the 750, indeed they'll come to the mountain of Jehovah and there's where the word of the Lord would go forth from Jerusalem. And he's going to place it on the height. It's going to be uh, from the topmost of its young twigs, a tender one. I think he's speaking of the salted one. That would be Jesus Christ. And I think he's point, there's pointers toward when he gives them hope, just like he did with the temple, with God's people. There's going to be a greater glory connected with, it, with that in his kingdom that cannot be shaken. And there's, there's glory that's going to come. But it was more than just, well, we're going back to Jerusalem. It was the idea that there would be one, a twig, two, he's king. And when they come back to Jerusalem, they're not having kings and so forth. But that's that's what they're they're going to be uh, enjoying. So in the midst of judgment on the kings, upon the people, 
There is God at the end of that setting forth uh, hope. And what, when we read that and realize we're part of that now, we're the people of God. But it, it's very important that we, when we keep our oaths, that's what Zedekiah failed, failed to do. And that's what he, he, he should have done. Uh, look at 2 Kings 23. Really, we'll, we'll see Zedekiah, what, what happened. Is 2 Kings 23, 31. Well, Jehoaz was, was, was 23 years old. And uh, he speaks about Jehoaz and Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he began to reign. He reigned 11 years and so forth. And in his days, Nebuchadnezzar the Babylon came up to Jehoiakim, became his servant and so forth. But there, there's these roles of kings coming forth. But we pick this king because of his oath. And that, he went to Egypt. That's, that labels him who we're, who we're talking about. Any questions on the parable, what it means, the significance of it? And he interprets it for us a little bit here. That Jesus does some of that in the parables, but not every facet. What why he has colors and that done? Uh, all these colors. What does it mean? Well, it's just a picture of this magnificent great eagle, long pinions, many feathers, uh, and the power to idea of plucking up twigs, plucking up off the ground. That's a reality that would happen in the life of an eagle. And what we're seeing, the people plucked up. They're not going to prosper. And they're going to be uh, plucked up and taken to captivity because Zedekiah didn't keep his oaths. So those are the lessons that we're observing there. So let's move on then to chapter 18. Chapter 18 is teaching what about fathers, sons, and sin. And let's read it because they had a saying that was going around in the days of Ezekiel and, and uh, the, the prophets the word of Jehovah came unto me, saying, What mean ye that ye use this proverb concerning the land of Israel? Saying, The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on what? On meds. You just cringe when you read that? <laughs> sour grapes? I can, I can feel it. And he, said, and he says, As I live, saith the Lord Jehovah, ye shall not have occasion, my Bible inserted, I think rightly so. You shall not have occasion anymore to use this proverb in Israel. And then he makes his declarative statement. Behold, all souls are mine. I'm in control of them. They're going to have to answer to me. I'm the one head. As a soul of the father, so is the soul of the son is mine. And the soul that sinneth, it shall die. That's something that is continuing to, to continue through uh, this, this chapter 18. So we begin to ask the question, that well, the, what is the teaching about fathers, sons, and sin? Well, they were just saying the fathers ate the sour grapes, and we're, 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 we're having to endure the, the consequences of that. But it's a little deeper than that, is that we've been kind of... Uh, they sin and we're being punished for it. You're not equal, God. That's not fair with you, God. And that's what's underlying this chapter. He's going to say, you say in verse 25, yet you say the way of the Lord is not equal. That somehow we're being punished and we're being punished for what our fathers did. Well, fathers can set an atmosphere. They can make their children's life horrible and they may have to ha suffer the effects of having an alcoholic father. Not enough money beaten up mom, not dependable. But these were making the point that we're going to have to die for the sins of our father, and that ain't fair. That's not fair. And God's going to tackle that one and deal, and deal with that. And so he divide, we divide this up into two main sections. The first section that we're looking at in this in verses 1 through 20, or from this point onward, verses 5 through 20, is dealing with sins that people do that indeed it, it affects others. And then we're looking at 
verses 21 following, these are sins I've done, but I repent. What then? I've done them. What, how does repentance work in that? And you'll notice when it closes in verse 31, there's the appeal. Cast away from you all your transgressions, where you have transgressed, and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will you die, O Israel, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dies, saith the Lord Jehovah. Wherefore, turn yourselves and do what? And live. That kind of tells you what he's driving at in the second half. Wonder if I do bad. Wonder if my father does bad. And I see him. And but wonder if he changes. And then he has, what if a righteous man starts doing evil? Is he because he lived righteously? What will happen to him? All these little details driving home personal responsibility for your sin. You can have forgiveness. Repent and Live that life. Have a new heart and a new spirit. That's the consequence of re repentance. It's a change of mind that leads, and a change of the heart that leads to a change of life. We're going to repent. We're going to turn from the, uh, the idolatrous ways of our fathers. That they've been an influence upon us. No one's contradicting that. Here we're putting the blame. Personal responsibility for my sins. And that, that is a, a principle here we see here, but it's a principle all through the New Testament. We're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an answer what my mean old daddy did. Nope. We're going to give an answer what we've done in our body, in the body, whether it be good or evil. Does that mean Christians, you know, I hear Christians are not going to the judgment. We all are. But we may be the ones that do good. We'll give an answer for that. And he'll, he'll judge our hearts. You hid those things from people, we're going to be answering for God. So we need to turn. We need to repent. We need to have a change of heart. We need to get right with God. And we can do that any time of the day we want to. When we have our, our mind right. And he's always ready to hear us. So that's kind of what we're looking at here. We'll look at some of the details. So the chapter 18, the teaching is about fathers, sons, and sin. Consequences of dad's sins, I'm responsible. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling that we're being judged for that. And they, they don't like that. And so we, we begin looking at, the, at, these, at these details. Notice in verse 5. If a man be just and do that which is lawful and right, and hath not eaten upon the mountains, neither hath lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, neither hath he fouled his neighbor's wife, neither hath they come near a woman in her impurity, hath not wronged any, but hath restored to the debtor his pledge, hath taken naught by robbery, hath given his bread to the hungry, and hath covered the naked with the garment. He that hath not given forth upon interest, neither hath taken any increase and, and hath withdrawn his hand from iniquity and hath executed true justice between man and hath walked in my statutes and hath kept my ordinances to deal with truth, to deal truly. He is just and he shall what? And you say, I guess so. <laughs> you read that list, pretty good fellow, wasn't he? I guess so. God would, God would, well, God said, because that was part of the commandments of God. It didn't say he lived perfectly on those things, but this was the pattern of his life. And he begins with something that we'd all agree on. I think that's a good way of when you're dealing with people that are disagreeing with you. Where do we agree? Well, I can agree with this one. And you just get tired of reading what a good guy he was, don't you? A lot of commandments of being just with our fellow man and not, not, you know, he, he and hath covered the naked with a garment. He hath helped the needy. He's not. He, he has a charge interest on what he he has give along to people, or an absorbent in, interest, usury, and so forth. 
And he just walked in my statutes. He lays that whole thing out there. You say, yeah, we understand that, God. But verse 10, here's somebody else. See, this is a person. Now, we're gonna, if he, so we're going to take it a step further down. If he begets a son, and he's just kind of the opposite, isn't he? He's a robber. He's a shedder of blood. That doeth one of these things, and, and, and that doeth any of one of these things. He that doeth not any of these duties, even hath he eaten upon the mountains and defiled his neighbor's wife. He hath wronged the poor and needy and so forth. He says, verse 13, he hath given forth upon interest and hath taken increase. Shall he live? He said, he shall not live. He shall not live. He hath done all these abominations. He shall surely die. His blood shall be upon him. God hasn't changed any of his principles. Told a story. Again, we realize, well, here is a, a son. Horrible, you know, good father, horrible son. Now, lo, if he beget a son in verse 14, that seeth his father's sin. So we're going down to grandson from the beginning. If he begets a son, he's bad. Which he has done and feareth and doth not such like. So he sees those sins. I've lived in a horrible, horrible uh, home life with my father. But I see that I'm not going to be like him. And he hath not eaten upon the mountains. Neither hath he lifted up his eyes and so forth. Neither hath he wronged any. He has not taken all of a pleasure anything. He, has, he, has drawn, he has withdrawn his hands from the poor. Verse 17. And the latter part of that, and that hath not received interest or increase, hath executed my ordinances, hath walked in the statutes, he shall not die for the iniquity of his father. Now we're getting close to their situation. Here he is, he will not die. His father ate sour grapes, and he has to have his teeth set on edge. He has his life serving God. And so... He draws that point, and he, and he says in verse, in verse 18, and did that which was, well, as, as far as father, because he cruelly oppressed, robbed his brother, and did that which is not good among his people. Behold, he shall die in his iniquity. Now he devised personal responsibility. So here it was, sour grapes of a father, but what about this one? And you would have to agree with this next one. See, that's why he gives the details. That he draws us in. So well, I, that's fair. <laughs> that's just. That's justice to me. God is always just. He has his laws. And we're to live up to those laws. But he's a life and death situation is the fact he did not that. He, he didn't do that. So he drives home the point. Verse 19. Yet you say, whereof doth not the son bear the iniquity of the father when the son hath done that which is lawful and right and had kept all my statutes and had done them, he shall surely live. So he, did, he, wasn't, he wasn't responsible. He didn't pay a penalty of death before God. The soul, here's where he gets the point. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. It works both ways. Neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteous of the righteous shall be upon him. That sounds just. And the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. That sounds just. So the personal responsibility argument is how God rules. And that's the way he, he does that. There's not the idea that I'm tainted by the sins of the father to the point that I am in a depraved condition or anything like that. So it's that personal responsibility. David? At least to those, doesn't it? Right. I think it's exactly right. It's one of the good lessons. I hope we can kind of keep it in, in context of, of what Ezekiel and God was trying to teach his people. They were advocating that, well, we're being punished for what our fathers did. And no, you're being punished for your sins. <laughs> and they'll be punished for their sins. And that's the way it's always, always been. 
And so there's this, as David said, the idea of the total depravity that we're born in sin because we're, we're born of that seed and it's transferred to our, our children. And therefore they are, they're born in sin. That's why they need to be baptized as babies. It, leads, it led to that type of uh, doctrine, which is, which in, then that contradicts other teaching, doesn't it? You gotta be a believer, babies can't, can't do that. And that inherited sin, and then he works both ways, inherited righteousness. We don't inherit the righteousness of Christ, but that's in Calvinism too. It allows us that we remain sinners, but Jesus covers up our shortcomings and we don't, and then what that leads to, I don't really have to worry about, about the life I live because Christ covered it and I have my trust in him. Well, there, there's some Calvinists that say that's, that way, if you're gonna be saved by Christ, you're gonna have to do what he says. So they, they stop short of that, but why would you? Why would you be careful? What is it? But when you realize I'm responsible, he that doeth righteousness is righteous and First John speaks that same same way. Is is that's that's the basis of just, and nothing's imputed to me either way. His perfect life is never imputed to us, so we can have confidence. Thank you, in, in our salvation. That's that's what is being argued. But, but you'll 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 go blind trying to read it, and read Romans four eleven times. Imputation is used, and not one time. Is Christ's perfect life imputed to you? We'll, we'll stop there and we'll, we'll pick up uh, the, the second half of this chapter, Lord willing, and we'll get into the, the rest of the chapters. And lesson five is there for your, pick it up and it's on our website and, and uh, enjoy your studies. Thank you.